Good morning, everybody. Um, just as Dave said, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to come back to a Sheffield, and this is probably the first and the only big gastroenterology meeting for this year, so I hope you enjoy it. I hope the technology works. Uh, if it doesn't, apologies. Uh, we'll try and do it as quickly as we can. Um, Dave has given me the challenge of talking about endoscopic reflux treatments. Uh, this is not an area that is very popular in the UK. Uh, I'll share with you some data on uh, our experience with using one form of endoscopic treatments. Um, these are my disclosures. So the objectives of the next 15 minutes of my talk is to uh, set the scene of why we are talking about endoscopic treatments for reflux disease, particularly when uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, anti-reflux surgery and fundoplication has been around for years now, and we all know that it works. So we're going to put it into context of why endoscopic treatments might uh, be part of our paradigm for managing reflux disease. Uh, in the short time of 15 minutes, I won't be able to cover all the available endoscopic treatments, so I will concentrate on the two that are most popular. Uh, one's called Streta. If uh, you have heard about it, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, I'll talk you through Streta. And the second is transoral incisionless fundoplication version 2, which is the new kid on the block. Uh, I will not be discussing GERD-X or any of the other uh, options for reflux management, which includes the Lynx device and Endostim. So we all know from uh, this excellent paper published earlier this year that the incidence of gastroesophageal reflux disease is increasing. The all-age prevalence has increased by 18%. Uh, the prevalence is also increasing in older age and in the aging population. Uh, and one of the things that we know very well from all the referrals that we get from our primary care colleagues is that over 50% of reflux disease is non-erosive and repeated endoscopy does not work. And over the last decade, we have an increasing and a better awareness of other functional and benign esophageal conditions, particularly functional heartburn and ecclesia and other motility disorders, which will also be covered today, to put reflux into the real context of where treatments can, be, can make a difference. So is endoscopic treatment really required or is anything more than PPI required for reflux disease? This is a survey of over 70,000 patients in the United States, again published earlier this year, which shows that two out of five people with reflux uh, symptoms continue to have symptoms. One out of three has symptoms in the past week and persistent symptoms are present in 50% of patients. So we're not really treating reflux very well, despite three decades of PPI usage. Uh, and this is a paper from the New England Journal, which shows that PPIs are less effective in treating reflux symptoms. They are very effective in treating erosive esophagitis, not so effective for treating non-erosive disease. And in the United States, uh, PPI refractory reflux is the most common reason for referral to a gastroenterologist. Um, and this is a graphical representation showing you that erosive esophagitis is probably best treated by PPI. So why don't PPIs work? The PPIs don't work because of various reasons. Abnormal acid reflux may persist despite PPI treatment. People may have reflux hypersensitivity and there may be other conditions such as functional heartburn. And the surgeons will tell you that PPIs don't work more than 50% of the time for the patients that are referred to them. And an anatomical correction of the lower esophageal sphincter with repair of the crural defect will prevent reflux uh, progression. This is the famous LOTUS trial published about 10 years ago which showed that when you compare PPIs to fundoplication, for heartburn, fundoplication actually comes out better than PPIs, whereas for dysphagia, fundoplication has a higher incidence of dysphagia. But the bottom line is that the long-term outcomes of both PPIs and fundoplication are nearly equivalent. And the 
IKRAS guidelines put down indications for referring patients for anti-reflux surgery. I won't go into them because of shortage of time. And medical versus surgical treatment for refractory heartburn shows that treatment with surgery is effective in 67% of patients. And the conclusion from this paper from the New England Journal was that surgery is superior to medical treatment. So you, we, we might be thinking that as gastroenterologists, we are probably fighting a losing battle here. And in order to do something new and innovative, we need to think about endoscopic treatments in addition to fundoplication. So this is the most important thing to take into account in terms of thinking about which endoscopic treatments might work. So the uh, esophagogastric junction barrier is composed of two things. There is the internal sphincter or the lower esophageal sphincter as we know it, and there is an external crural diaphragm. And most endoscopic treatments are designed to address the lower esophageal sphincter, whereas the surgeons will tell you that it is equally important to take care of the crural diaphragm. The ASG Technology Committee in 2017 did not recommend Streta as an effective treatment for endoscopic management of reflux, but TIF and GERD were recommended for it. So what is Streta? Streta is a non-ablative radiofrequency technique where energy is delivered to the lower esophageal sphincter. We still don't know exactly how strata works, but one of the popular hypotheses is that it acts by increasing lower esophageal sphincter muscle thickness and also does neuromodulation to reduce visceral hypersensitivity. It is a balloon catheter which is introduced over the guide wire and is positioned across the lower esophageal sphincter. The catheter has four needles which are retractable, they are 5.5 millimeters and actually go to about four millimeters into the wall of the lower esophagus at the gastroesophageal junction. And the aim is to carry out four levels above the LOS and two below the LOS and create 56 thermal lesions uh, in a non-ablative manner. And animal models show that Radio frequency energy delivery to the small uh, to the smooth muscle causes structural changes, also increases collagen one, and probably leads to a degree of fibrosis at the LOS, thereby strengthening the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, the balloon uh, inflates to 2.5 psi, and the target tissue temperature is between 65 to 85 degrees, with a mucosal temperature of 35 degrees. And we use 14 one-minute cycles to produce 56 thermal ablations. The meta-analysis of over 20 studies, which included two RCTs and 18 cohort studies published by Perry, showed that Streta works for improving GERD, uh, HRQL, SF36, heartburn scores, patient satisfaction, and esophageal acid exposure time. NICE approved Streta several years ago, and there have been a number of systematic reviews which have shown that Streta does work. Equally, there has been a systematic review which showed that Streta probably may not work. So the jury is still out for Streta. We started Streta in 2014 uh, in the Northeast, and what we did was we had patients with confirmed reflux disease, unresponsive, uh, to medical management with standard and double dose PPI. They had to have a hiatus hernia of less than two centimeters. Uh, they needed to be symptomatic for reflux disease for at least three months prior to being recruited into the trial. All patients were administered a GERD health related quality of life questionnaire before and after strata. And I'll show you the results as median values. The procedure was carried out initially under general anesthesia, but we started doing it in the endoscopy unit in the uh, second half of the study. A single endoscopist carried out the procedure to reduce uh, any procedural bias and, tec and technical bias. Uh, we did the usual standard protocol of 56 uh, applications to the LOS. The initial results uh, 
uh, of 50 patients showed that over a median follow-up of 700 days, uh, the GERD, HRQL, heartburn scores, regurgitation, all improved post-procedure with a patient satisfaction score of 78%. Uh, we now have done over 200 patients uh, with Streta, and this study was presented at the UEGW showing that there is a definite improvement in patient's quality of life, the need for PPIs post Streta up to two years, improvement in individual heartburn and regurgitation scores and overall QLs with almost no procedural complication. And the paper was published in Frontline Gastroenterology. Now moving on to TIFF, TIFF is a gastroesophageal junction reconstructive procedure, almost anatomically similar to surgical fundoplication. The main difference is that TIFF doesn't address the crural diaphragm, but aims to reconstruct the gastroesophageal junction, almost similar to laparoscopic uh, fundoplication. The gastric fundus is folded up and around the distal esophagus and is anchored by proline sutures, which are on fasteners. The ideal patients are those are with a HEL2. Uh, the, the kit looks somewhat sort of uh, threatening in that sense. It's a big tube that goes in general, under general anesthesia. It folds back upon itself, and the aim is to turn the device in a sort of clockwise manner to do a 270 degree fundoplication. So this is how it uh, looks, you go in under general anesthesia with the TIFF device, you, f you retrovert, you then pull down sharply to bring the uh, fundus down between the two arms of the TIFF, and then you deploy between 12 to 20 fasteners uh, at the uh, GOJ in a 270 degree wrap along a three centimeter length of the valve. So that's how you create the equivalent of a laparoscopic fund application. Uh, the first version of TIFF has now been improved, so we now have TIFF 2. There are about sort of 1,500 procedures done worldwide with a two-year uh, follow-up data mostly from Europe. Between 79 to 85% of patients were off PPIs, 56% reported resolved non-acid symptoms, Similar improvement in health-related uh, health quality of life with almost similar to strata satisfaction at two years. And it compares very well to Nissen fundoplication on all the metrics of quality of life. Uh, TIFF has also been compared to GERD-X and MUSE, and the three devices are nearly similar in their outcomes both in terms of Demeester score improvement, acid exposure time, improvement of esophagitis, and quality of life. So where do we place TIFF? I think TIFF is an emerging technology. Uh, my friend and colleague from UCL, Rehan Hydri, has done the first six or eight TIFF procedures in London. Uh, as far as I know, he's the only one doing TIFF at the moment. And it is a device that probably is going to take some time to establish itself as uh, a technology that is uh, going to stand the test of time. We know that a number of endoscopic technologies for reflux management have come and gone, but at the moment we think that TIFF and Streta are here to stay. Uh, FDA approved Streta way back in 2000 and TIFF was approved in 2007. There are two other technologies which are endoscopically available. One is anti-reflux mucosectomy. So here is a picture of anti-reflux mucosectomy where the mucosa at the GOJ is resected, again, 270 degrees to create uh, 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 an iatrogenic stricture at the GOJ, but just enough to reduce reflux, but not to cause uh, dysphagia. The, the two technologies that are competing with us are the magnetic uh, sphincter augmentation or the LINX procedure, which is the top right, and endostim. Uh, because these are not endoscopic procedures, I won't be discussing them. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anjan. <laughs> we have uh, a, a minute or two for questions. We have uh, some. What, the first one is, what is the recurrence rate of GORD after Streta? Uh, so in the first year, less than 15% of our patients needed PPIs to control symptoms of reflux. They do get a bit of reflux, but it is not uh, enough for them to take PPIs. As you stretch out the follow-up to four years, up to 30% of patients will need to take PPIs at four years. And uh, how operator de uh, dependent is TIF and what is the learning curve? Uh, difficult one to answer. Uh, I, I have no personal experience of TIF, but uh, there will be a learning curve, particularly because the device needs to be rotated uh, around a clock face to do a 270 degree uh, uh, sort of plication. Uh, but I don't think the learning curve is going to be very difficult uh, to master. Thank you. Uh, the ASG recommendation is to be able to do 20 procedures before you're certified as com competent for TIFF. Thank you, Anjan. I think we'll um, bring uh, that talk um, to a close. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there are a number of other questions. I'm just wondering if you might be able to address them online. Uh, but thank you very much. It would be a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, following from...